in which we will um, we'll have it right after worship, so 10.50-ish. Um, and the nominating committee has a report for us, and then we will elect people to serve the congregation in the upcoming years. And uh, we need to vote on pastor's terms of call. That will be immediately following worship next Sunday, and then we will go right into a time of fellowship. Worship will be normal on Facebook, then we will switch to Zoom. So check your emails, be sure you have that link, and please join, because we can't do congregational business without people signing on. Um, We have fabulous news this week. Our Hillcrest Hope resident is graduating. She will graduate, I believe, Tuesday night. Um, So that is an exciting uh, joy that we get to celebrate. We also will have a new resident or family, we don't know who yet, moving in soon. Hillcrest Hope has a waiting list, and so they know that someone will be moving in very shortly. Um, This will be, hopefully, our person that will um, be with us during the Christmas season as well. And so we will have, usually we have an angel tree in the back where you can take an ornament off that tells what gifts to buy. We're going to do that all electronically this year, um, but that will be coming. Also, our small mall that we have run for Liberty Academy students Uh, for several years so that they can buy gifts to give to their family and friends, um, not with money, but with the points that they have. Um, The small mall is still going to happen this year. However, as as the session has said, our congregation um, in-person activities have been suspended to the end of the year. So we are collecting items for the small mall store The teachers at the school who are already in contact with those kids will run the store. That way there's less contact among people. Um, There, In your email, there's lists of items of things that would be good. Um, Remember, you can purchase online and have things shipped. You uh, don't ship to the church. Also, oh, if you have things shipped to your house, the, the serve committee is going to do a serve parade on December 13th and come around and pick up items you have. So gather your items at home and they will come collect them from you. Um, also, next Sunday, after worship, after the congregational meeting, after fellowship, from 12 to 1.30, the serve, no, the foundation committee is having a pickup event in our parking lot. Um, They are creating advent bags for everybody. Every family needs to have a bag for advent so that you can participate at home in our Christmas service and in our Christmas Eve service. Um, there There are items in the bags that you will need to have. So please mark your calendar to come by the church parking lot next Sunday between 12 and 1.30 after our meetings Um, to pick up your bag. Those are all the announcements that I have this morning. Let us worship God.
Friends, please join me in our call to worship as is printed in your bulletin. Holy God, you come to transform your church, to be a living sign of your love for the world, where the poor are filled with good things, the dividing walls are broken down, and the dead are raised to new life. We, your church, are ready to be transformed. We open our hearts and our minds to you in worship. Friends, a voice is crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, trusting in God's grace. Let us confess our sin. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have wandered from your way of truth and life. You call us to share all that we have and work together for the common good. But we hoard up treasures for ourselves and deny others their daily bread. You call us to set the captives free and seek justice for the oppressed but we live in fear of our neighbors and hide ourselves from our own kin. You call us to walk in newness of life and to be witnesses to the resurrection, but we dwell in the valley of dry bones and keep silent about your saving love. Forgive us, God of grace. Set us free from sin, death, and fear so that we may serve you with gladness. Hear our silent prayer of confession. Amen. Friends, we pour the water, reminding us always that God's mercy and justice are the stuff of life, just like the water that keeps us alive. Through Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let's sing our joy with hymn number 464 in the blue hymnal, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
Please pray with me. Speak to us, O God, with the voice of your Holy Spirit, that we may hear and understand and know the ways of Christ our Lord. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Listen now for a word from God. For it is as if a man, going on a journey, summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one to each according to his ability. Then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed over to me five talents. See, I have made five more. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over to me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave, You knew, did you, that I reap where I do not sow and gather where I did not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And on my return, I would have received what was mine own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have, more will be given. And they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, there was a big debate on social media and on the Internet about whether a particular dress was white and gold or black and blue. How you saw that dress depended on your eyes, depended on the lighting, depended on the picture that you were looking at. The striking thing about that is that the people who saw the dress as white and gold were certain they were right and nobody else could have a different opinion. And the people who saw it as black and blue, well, they were certain they were right. Nobody else could be correct if they saw something different. The same thing happens in elections in our country. 
We've gotten away from civil conversations with the goal of understanding where the other person is coming from. Instead, we've closed our minds to anything different than what we believe to be true. That's the mindset we cannot use when we approach today's scripture lesson because it's a parable. And I hope that hearing that this is a parable puts you into the mind frame of listening to understand from a different perspective than maybe you have in the past. Listen carefully and see what shimmers for you. I remind you, like I often do, that looking at a parable can be like looking at a prism, where which side of the prism you look through helps you to see the story slightly differently. By listening to one another, by sharing the views that we see, understanding can grow. Traditionally, we're going to start there, people read this parable as an allegory. In this understanding, Jesus is the master who entrusts great wealth. Great wealth because one talent is estimated to be worth about 15 years' wages for a day laborer. This master invests great wealth into three servants. The servants represent the church. It's the church's job then to multiply that wealth. The master departs. That mirrors the ascension of Jesus to sit at the right hand of God And then the the master's return mirrors the parousia, which is the coming of Christ in glory. If we continue with this allegorical reading, the rewards and the punishments for those three servants, well, that's judgment day at the end of time. According to this reading, this understanding, this side of the prism of this parable, The master, the God, is kind and loving and trusting. Thomas Stegman writes, the discretion and care of the master are worth considering. He takes into account his servant's capabilities. Thus, he does not impose an unreasonable burden on them. Nor does the master give specific directions. Rather, He allows his servants the freedom to take initiative. People say, what a loving way to offer them the freedom to use their gifts and skills according to what they are capable of. In other words, many people read this as, the master won't give you more than you can handle. That's a statement that I've heard misused and abused many times. And it doesn't live up to what I have seen to be true in many people's lives. In this understanding of the parable, the servant who refuses to invest the talent is wicked and lazy, ruled by fear. He's judged harshly and thrown into the outer darkness. We might say that this was his one chance, and he threw away his shot. Some commentators say that the lesson of this parable is that life is about investing and taking risks, and that the greatest risk of all is to not risk anything, to play it safe. But I wonder about another way to read this parable. What if the third servant represents Jesus as he was disrupting the power dynamic of an unjust system? The scripture tells us that the master was a harsh man, 
reaping where he did not sow, gathering where he did not scatter seed. But the scripture also says the servant was wicked and lazy. Have you ever stopped to question which you believe and why? It's my guess that almost all of us simply believed that the master was right in his assessment of the servant and that the servant was wrong. Our culture has taught us well. We have learned to give more credence to people with power in a system. Both racism and poverty have been perpetuated by this pattern. Why do we believe the master and not the servant? Or a teacher and not a student? Or a movie director over an actor? Or someone wealthy over someone poor? You get the idea. During the last 50 years or so, we've begun to wake up to our penchant for thinking this way and to the injustices that this system perpetuates. Think about police officers. There was a time when their word would never have been questioned. As if by simply putting on that uniform, they became the perfect model citizen rather than a mixed up sinful human being trying to do their best and sometimes failing. The same thing happened in the church world. Clergy were put on pedestals, believed to do no wrong. But the sex scandal and subsequent cover-up in the Catholic Church, but really in all denominations, was a wake-up call that just because a person has power doesn't mean they aren't sinful and that they aren't capable of of making gross errors in judgment. Or consider the President of the United States. There was a time when that position was revered simply because great power was invested in the person holding that office. But with great lapses in judgment and the unveiling of the reality that even presidents are subject to scandal and cover-ups, and adultery, and lying. We have begun to question whether power actually means someone is more of a model citizen than anybody else. Watergate rocked the country. Monica Lewinsky is a name that everybody over a certain age recognizes. Fact checkers are hard at work any time there is a presidential debate or the president speaks to determine whether the statements are true or to what percentage they are true. It turns out power is not a protector. Power does not ensure that someone is as good a person as we wish it did. So what if that third servant hid the talent in the ground because the master really was harsh and wicked. And the risk of investing and losing the money just wasn't worth it. Or what if that servant recognized that the gains made on the money by investing it had to come from somewhere? On whose backs were those gains earned? In the United States, Many years ago, wealth was earned on the backs of those indentured servants and slaves that worked the land in the South. They didn't see the benefits of their labor, but the master, who had the power, sure did line his pockets. Could it be that that third servant, the one we're supposing to be Jesus, hid that money in the ground 
as a way to resist an unjust system? Maybe it was a way to say, I will not participate in a power dynamic where the rich get richer while the poor grow poorer. Certainly that comes at a cost. The wicked master returned and banished the third servant into the outer darkness where there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when we think about it, if the third servant is representing Jesus, isn't that actually exactly what happened? Jesus was crucified for being a resistance fighter. And he descended into hell and stayed there for three days before being raised from the dead. Good Friday and Holy Saturday are not joyful celebrations. We grieve the loss of hope with the disciples and we cower in fear with them, thinking at that time that the empire has won. But of course we know the rest of the story. Death is not the end. Jesus doesn't stay in a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. In fact, Hope is resurrected, and the servant son is raised to sit at the right hand of God, the Almighty. Maybe we should read this parable as resistance of the empire, as a way to subvert the story that power is always right, as an Easter story about the resurrection of hope and life. Maybe our lives will be changed by a new reading of an old story. May it be so. Amen. Our special music today comes from Cole Bauer playing piano, and I'm going to try and turn the screen so you can see him.
Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Let us come before God with the prayers in our hearts. Loving God, we offer our prayers to you this day. Prayers for the church and the world, for neighbors and for loved ones. We ask your provision for all people. Teach us compassion and generosity. Put an end to exploitation. Fill this world with your abundant life. We search for your beloved community. Use us to break down systems of oppression, dismantle patterns of privilege, establish justice and equality for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We knock at the door of your house, O God. Gather us in as disciples of your way. Nourish us in faith, and faithfulness. Send us out to share your good news. We pray especially for those we hold in our hearts and minds. We've got many names listed in the comments today. For the Lemasters, for Callie's student at MCC, for Eric, for Scott Paul, for Peggy Chase, for David Carlson's cousin Paul, for my mom. We pray with celebration for our Hillcrest Hope resident, Connie. We grieve with the Fox family at the passing of Ron's son and Rusty's brother, and we pray for Ron's health. We pray for Betty's brother-in-law, Bruce, and brother, Rich. We pray for Tony and Carl in hospice care. We pray for Laura and Charlotte, for Kylie and her whole family. We ask for blessings of safe travels for those who have found ways to travel safely. We pray for Sophie Murphy and her family and a student, Jacob. We pray for Harvey and Nancy and Lou and Amanda and Faith and Molly, for Janet and Marvin. We pray for all students, for all teachers, for all police officers and nurses and health care workers. We pray for Kenny and for the Wallace family as they deal with illness. We pray for all of those in the military and for those in care facilities and for all leaders and first responders and decision makers. Living God, we ask and we search and we knock. Answer our prayers with the power of your spirit. Hear us as we pray the prayer Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus says the realm of heaven has come near. Freely you have received, therefore freely give. Let us offer our lives to the Lord. 
We can offer financial resources at fpcliberty.org or through our bank or in the mail. You can offer your service and your love in every moment of every day. Our offerings help support the church's mission to eradicate systemic poverty, to dismantle structural racism, and to build congregational vitality. We pray that God will send us out to share our gifts with others. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, let's sing together hymn number 268, God Who Stretched the Spangled Heavens. Friends, the God who was and who is and who is to come is with us in Christ Jesus. The blessing of the triune God be with you all. Jesus says, remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Carry that message and that love everywhere you go. Amen.